get the recording. <clears throat> recording. All right, sounds good. Um, so the next content is uh, just to once again recreate. Um, Uh, Power BI metadata related content. Um, so we do create a lot of Power BI artifacts, put it in there in the ser on service. Um, we could, you know, there are a lot of ways we, we have tried in the past to hold our inventory. Um, we have tried multiple solutions to have like a data catalog, to have a um, a purposeful or, you know, the purpose of a report or a dashboard that we put out there, uh, even though I mean that that could be a part of the data glossary, but that's more so about the purpose of the report itself. So whenever somebody is searching for a report, so to speak, like a reporting catalog, uh, so whenever somebody is looking for some specific content, they can go to a particular workspace in this Power BI instance. Um, and they can look at a particular report saying, okay, this dashboard gives me everything I want. Or in case you guys have users, then they know our super users, then we give them some access and they can go and look at the data sets, knowing that data sets are going to give them some level of data uh, that they're looking for and they can create build reports and dashboards on top of it. Um, all these are great. What happens in the Power BI metadata realm? Like we put all those content, Power BI itself gives us, gives the admins the ability to look at what happens in their workspace. They give us the usage metrics app, so it tells the, uh, the admins, you know, the specific Reports are being uh, are being used. Those specific reports are being consumed. These often, like these many users have run it so many times, and so on and so forth. Um, but at a different granularity, the artifact itself that we post out there, we need some backend information on that and how they are connected to each other, and how not just one artifact is connected. But multiple of them. So in our um, in our system, uh, if you have been in one of the prior three part series that I've gone through, how we do our data sets and uh, reports, our dashboards, um, our system is a setup where we create data sets, and then off of the data sets, we create dashboards and reports because. If you're familiar, a single PBIX file can hold both the content and the data set. Uh, we have tried keeping away from that methodology just so we could get a lot of use out of the same data set um, um, instead of just creating targeted one data set and one report only for that data set. So um, for the purpose of reusability, we have enforced that you have to create a report uh, off of the data set. <clears throat> So what this means for the metadata is also, we're trying to at some level figure out somebody putting out all these content. They know these are the reports related to, uh, these are the reports related to a data set and so on and so forth. Now, all those kind of information, you can go into a workspace and find out. Even the question that Andy asked a little bit ago was a great question. How do I know what refreshes happened? What refresh uh, worked and which failed? Either you can go here, look at each of those workspaces, look at the settings and see if this uh, worked or not. And keep in mind that this is only if you have access to the workspace content part of it. Now, this information can be very helpful for other developers in your team to notify or do something on the downstream part of their dashboard or something that they have to you know, either notify manually, even though you have that notification center, they still have to notify a group of people um, because not always do all of our content users 
normally have to look and get information from that single space. Uh, so if they do, uh, another place is, you know, not just this, I showed a little bit ago, um, you get emails if you are the data set owner. And again, that's only if you are a data set owner or if you're part of a group and you're added to that data set. So for instance, I can get added to this particular data set uh, in case the you know refresh fails or something, then I can always say, you know, send a notification for failure to a group and then I can add, you know, currently it's only set for owner, but I can add other contacts and I could ideally you don't want usernames, you just want uh, groups um, and people to be in and out of the group. So it's easier to manage it. Otherwise you'd be maintaining this again, uh, the user list manually a lot. So uh, simple, simpler stuff. Um, you can do this scheduled refresh. You can add that, uh, con whoever needs to be on that. Again, it's good, great to know that something failed, but to propagate this information from uh, an email that you got for like 200 different data sets, identifying what those critical ones are is another task. Uh, again, all this information is somewhere out there. We, we put all this information, it's great, but it's somewhere out there in the service. And part of it, and uh, you know, Microsoft, they have done a good job in the product development team. They're putting out some APIs. Now, it would be great if we keep asking for more items in the APIs so we can get more targeted information that will help us with our insights about our artifacts. Now, the metadata itself, uh, I'm going to show the back end of what, um, what I've built over a while, over a period. Um, so <clears throat> bear with me, because some of these items were created um, as we learned about Power BI itself. So um, that as we learned about it, we just kept adding stuff. So uh, um, this is not the best, I mean, the best standards or practices for how you would name things and all might not be great here. Uh, but at some point, uh, once we have come to a mature model, uh, which I would show um, uh, in a little bit, but also uh, I will show you a couple of things. One, what, uh, what items you have in the Power BI dataset realm, sorry, Power BI metadata realm, uh, what, I, what APIs you can kind of call. Personally, I use PowerShell, so I'm, I'll show you some of the PowerShell code that I'm using currently. Uh, again, uh, just bear in mind, this is uh, something uh, I've been working since I've done Power BI, uh, picked it up and going. So not best coding, but I'm trying to replace all that coding in my spare time uh, to uh, like, you know, functions and stuff like that in PowerShell. So it's a lot more easier. So in, in about a couple of weeks, maybe a month, at the max, I would have some of these code for getting the Power BI metadata in a project, in a GitHub project, so you can look at it, you can download it. We'll have a list of SQL for, you know, like the create tables and stuff like that, and the API content and stuff like that. So it should be a sim uh, simpler understanding and, you know, a setup whenever you want to use this in your place too. <clears throat> And so one of the things you can see is in a custom database, I've set the list of tables. They all start with SSM Power BI. In our naming convention was to say SSM, so we know whenever we look at it, it's a custom table that we created. Um, and then Power BI to make sure we know it's Power BI. Uh, now again, my content itself, my um, code itself would include at some level if you want to have Power BI as a part of the table name, or if you want to have it as like a schema name instead, so you could use it there. And you should be able to put this in Azure SQL or SQL Server on-prem. I would say it would be better to put in on a cloud source because most of the things are now transitioning to cloud. Um, but so uh, moving into some of these metadata things. So, 
you can see a list of Power BI artifacts that we have, like data sets, um, uh, in the order where it's like data sets. Um, let me show you this. This would be the list of artifacts in a way. Um, <clears throat> I've called it raw just because it's going to be in a table and stuff. So I was trying to create like a flow diagram for the list of tables and API calls and everything related to it. So you have a visual understanding too. Um, but you can see that, you know, there's a capacity within a tenant. Uh, you could have multiple capacities. Uh, and, you know, each capacity, if it's not a personal workspace, it gets assigned to, uh, uh, sorry, if a workspace is not a personal workspace, it may get assigned to a capacity, especially in our specific case, we're using premium capa uh, capacity. So, uh, it's not premium for user, but premium. So we do get a lot more uh, from it. So we are able to do this. So in case you do not have that same pricing, you don't you don't have the same subscription, you may or may not have access to call the APIs and stuff like that. Um, so in our case, the premium workspaces are connected to capacities. We have a couple of capacities. Uh, a P1 for our development, um, yeah, all the development environments, and then we have a development test and a production environment. Um, so all those, uh, the tests in the prod are in a P3, which is 100 gig um, node, and then P1 is a 25 gig node, if I'm not wrong. Um, so that capacity is getting assigned to a workspace, and then within a workspace, you have data sets. And then, you know, all this information that we put in a data set, you know, like a data set parameter, refresh history, refresh schedule, like you were asking a little bit ago. <laughs> so those are all API calls. Uh, also within a workspace, you have report. And, you know, within a report, you have multiple pages. You can call APIs to identify what those page names are and stuff. And you can do some. Will you tell me the data set associated to my report? Oh, sorry, say that one more time. Will you tell me the data set that's associated to my report? Yes. So, so I can get that because like, if this. I got one data set down, I might need to notify 50 reports. Right. Yes, exactly. So, yes. So, it will. So, there is a connection between those two. Um, there is one small um, uh, thing in that, too. Um, so when I'm talking about these Power BI reports, I'm straight, mostly talking about Power BI desktop created reports, PBIX files, not the RDLs. Uh, those are slightly more complex if you have used SSRS and our, you know, the um, the report builder aspect. Um, since multiple data sets, uh, sorry, excuse me, multiple data sets could be within called within the same uh, report, RDA. Um, it does not follow this process strictly. Uh, you can still get information on the report, but you will not have that connection between data set and the report. Uh, so we have tried making even pixel perfect reports, the RDL ones, as much as possible into an insightful report using Power BI desktop, um, as much as possible. Again, there's like one or two outliers, for that, we do have a little bit of manual insert method that we do. Um, <clears throat> again, some of these manual methods too, um, for instance, even the workspace notification item, or even this one that we're talking about, some aspects that are still hard coded at this time, we could still use some Microsoft products like Power Apps. You could ingest data in the notification center. I could just keep editing and adding more data using a power app and put it into a database. So there's, if it's an admin that's doing this, a system admin who doesn't have access to, or you know, who doesn't have DBA rights into an ad, into a database, a DBA could give them access to that table. Our developer can create, create a power app, let them use that to ingest data and put it in a central place and do some of the manual process could be still maintained a little better. Um, 
<clears throat> Sorry, did I answer your question? Uh, all right. Get that whole feature. <laughs> yes, definitely. It does. RDL is, they're good, but they're, they're portable. They are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I quit them to RDLs, just like Romanian deadlifts. Are. <laughs> they are, they're like, why do we do Romanian deadlifts and then regular ones? It's a question that has to be answered. Um, sorry, do you have a question, Julie? And Teresa has one. Teresa, yes. please go ahead. Yeah, or did she put it out there? It says, how easy is it to use the Power BI REST API? I'm new to using APIs and trying to understand it for the future. Okay, how do we use Power BI REST APIs? And yes, exactly. So this entire session is going to be about that. So <laughs> don't worry. Uh, like I said, when I started this, I was new to PowerShell. Um, also, some, I'll show some of my code you. See, I probably cringe if you have some object oriented uh, uh, background and stuff, how much I did not understand. I was very tabular in my thoughts and to compare the object oriented it took a little bit. But um, so at the end of this presentation, what I'll do is I'll try try to again clean up. Uh, I'll put a placeholder at the in the video link where the GitHub space will show up after I am done putting my code in a decent, uh, once it gets to a decent spot, I'll put it in GitHub, that GitHub link will be available so you can always take a look at all this code later on. But I'm going to show you how the code is right now and how I run it um, and ways of automating it too, uh, which we're currently not doing due to various resource constraints, um, which I'm not going to go in detail about. Um, but don't worry, I'll show that pretty um, quickly. Um, let me go on. Um, sorry, so again, the link between report and data set, for most of them, that's there. The same thing with dashboards. So if you're familiar with dashboards, it comes from multiple reports. You can pin multiple report visuals into a dashboard. Uh, so a dashboard will have multiple tiles. So you have that dashboard to tile connection and report to report page info connection. <clears throat> so, um, so this is kind of like the overview of all the APIs. And actually there are a few more too, uh, like the audit info. So whenever, whatever happens within Power BI service, you could audit, you could collect all that uh, information saying, you know, somebody, viewed a report, somebody refreshed a report, all that information is available uh, as an API call. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of them. Some of them I do not, I'm pretty sure I won't have time for this uh, session, so I will save it for later, and I will give a brief intro of what those kind of information are, and then I'll move on to the next. Um, so, one of this, So uh, before I show the table, I'll go back to my REST API. Let me make one more time. All right. So I do not have any, I took out all the secrets and stuff. All right, that should be good. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you my PowerShell scripts. <laughs> so, if you are not, again, uh, super into coding, um, automating it, uh, orchestrating it using ADF, Airflow, whatever kind of orchestrator, or even like a task scheduler or job agent, whatever suits your resource needs and whatever you have access to, please feel free to do so. And again, it doesn't have to stay in um, PowerShell. As far as I know, REST APIs, the Power BI ones, you can use uh, almost any language. Uh, uh, you could use C sharp. You could use uh, um, Python. Uh, I might take that back about Python. C sharp, PowerShell, uh, maybe 
one more thing. Uh, so it's been a while since I looked at that page. Sorry about that. <clears throat> but you have uh, a code here. So if anybody wants to, at various point of time, all, uh, create you know, similar code in other languages too, please feel free to do so in your language of preference. Um, and also as a, another thing I want to mention before I go into the REST APIs itself, <clears throat> Power BI itself, uh, can do web scraping. So the Power Query can do web scraping. Uh, it can also connect to the REST APIs that Power BI offers. So it can connect to its own REST APIs and show you the list, this list of APIs. So I'm telling you this is our current state and stuff like that. So for a few instances, few objects, like the report info, um, the data set info, all those you could use just the uh, API available um, connector within Power BI itself because um, it's only a current state. If you, for some reason, want to audit it, keep an audit of various days of information, then that becomes slightly uh, different. And that's when you put in the database, which is why I also have it in the database. Um, otherwise, if it's if your need is simpler, you could just connect to this kind of this REST API using Power Query, have your Power BI itself show this information for you. Uh, so one of the simpler, yet massively helpful uh, what is it? item is the audit log. Uh, so whenever you have data uh, within Power BI service, uh, like this, you know, what did people do? How many times was a report viewed? Um, all those information are kept in this activity log. Uh, so the REST API itself is get Power BI activity event. So, you know, uh, APIs have some kind of get, post uh, kind of verbiage. Uh, you can look at the, uh, what is it? So you can look at the um, Power BI, REST APIs, and you can see a bunch of them. Um, I'm going into data set one, but you, you see a list of APIs on the left. Um, so whichever one you want, you can choose. So you know if you want to look at a capacity one, um, you can go to one and I I can see, you know, groups of energy capacity, which one do I want? Get capacity. I just want a list of my capacities. Uh, it tells you, you know, this is the API. This is what uh, my API is. And the good thing is you can also try it. You can say, you know, this is, I want to try. And, you know, it lets you sign in and stuff. And then you can, um, you can, get a list of your APIs. All, the, all you would need is just to run this. There might be some information that might be sensitive. I don't I don't know if I won't really want to show you the details of this, but the body itself would look very similar to what you have here. <clears throat> so it'll tell you the ID, the display, and stuff like that. So you get information about that particular object that you're trying to get information on. Uh, so if you want to take a look at how the rest of the API for your particular case will look like, you can just do this try it, which is very helpful. Um, this try it piece definitely is very helpful. So you get a list of the JSON for format. You can put it in some place and you can play with it, see what information you get out of it to see what and all you need to copy. So this is capacity. Uh, in this case, <clears throat> We have a lot like data sets that I was talking about, um, dashboards. Uh, if you go into it itself, it'll give you a bunch of, you know, get dashboard in a group or get dashboards in a group where I want, in a workspace, it gets me a list of dashboards and then get tiles in a group. Uh, get tiles in a group, sorry. So it gives me all the tiles within a dashboard, within a group. So, and again, you can see it's very similar. It has that get, and then it has like a, an HTTP. It's a it's a URL that you get out of it. Uh, so keep this in mind when I move back to my uh, excuse me um, PowerShell script. 
So this Power BI activity, even this very uh, one search, where, oh, that, it's a separate one, that's an API. It's not a REST API like this, but you can also see that. Um, the get bar, bar BI activity event gives you a list like this. Um, always, whenever you're looking at, the, at an API, make sure you look at all the parameters because all the parameters, can, especially time sensitive ones, time related ones, could be of so much use for you. In this particular case, what I am doing, uh, this API has a restriction of only 24 hours of data. So I'm getting only 24 hours of data, and after like 30 days of data, you do not get any more activity. Uh, so this is one of those audit ones that you want to keep putting in your database if you want a long-term insight about it. So um, I will quickly show you also related to the activity, how what kind of activities are there so you get an, get a sense and idea of what this API has. But for right now, looking at the API, it, it's, it is putting it, uh, like I said, this API has a 24 hour restriction. So you can have data only for 24 hour time period. Uh, so, you know, in my thing, I'm just looking back to a certain time frame. Um, and my code itself has some parts, again, not the best way I would have written it, um, but as it evolved, uh, the look back itself lets me see activities for various days. Now I could put it in a for each loop and stuff like that, but um, if I want to look back three days ago and do this, and remember there are only 30 days of uh, this information, so you want to keep doing this as frequent as possible, so I do this almost every day. Uh, so my look back is one in case I am out on vacation or something, I can always do that look back to a different day and get the content for that particular day. Uh, in this particular case, I mean, the way I've designed this, it goes into a file path, and since it goes into SQL Server on-prem, uh, I read it from JSON. Again, it's not the best way, uh, but you can you just take that output, put it into a table directly, uh, which in one of my newer APIs that I'm trying to like fix, I will show you how you can do that too. Um, this one again goes to a file path, looks at it. Um, since it's a JSON, uh, you can just read JSON in SQL Server. So I'm just reading all the related content. The one drawback of this is in my case, I would have to know all the names ahead of time, uh, put it in there, and there are like hundreds of fields there with this API, and there are more than one APIs. Uh, which is great, awesome. So I need to, uh, I'm sorry, more than one tables. So so I, I just have to make sure they are in sync and stuff like that. Cluttery, uh, I'm still doing it on PowerShell. Um, so it is a single transaction. I don't have to do the uh, staging or, you know, when I run the API, I don't do this here to go back to a different place and then run the sort procedure or something like that. It just did it in one place again. Uh, all this would change when I show you the new code and whenever it's up to date. Uh, but again, you can see all these fields have to be maintained. Um, all these fields are looking at stuff, uh, very important information. So for instance, uh, let me go up a little bit. Like for instance, this activity uh, it gives you the activity names, like view report and stuff like that. Um, capacity name, it is connected to a capacity dashboard, if it is a dashboard, if it is a data set, if it is a report, all those are tagged there. So as an example, if I were to show you, oops, sorry, wrong one. Um, So that's the that's my final activity log table. Uh, sorry, I know I'm on dark mode. <laughs> um, 
it's just I'm so I have this Power BI activity log table that I have in the database, which holds this activity log the data that came from the REST API. Uh, you can also see the list of columns in this activity log is all those stuff that you saw over there. Um, but I have cleansed it in this case to not have any of the names. Most of the names are out, all are IDs. In this case, the duets. Um, I ideally it would be a dim ID instead of a GUI, just an integer uh, going forward when I have better data model. Uh, the activity log stage is the one that will have this as a stage table or a source table that pulls the data from the API itself. Um, so let me show you. So this is the activity ID, capacity ID, and so on and so forth. Uh, let me open this a little bit. Like this. Okay. So in this case, I just created an internal ID that is corresponding to, instead of just a dim ID that meant nothing, I also have just tagged down to the date. So it's an, along with the row number, it's also a date. Uh, but you can see that the activity itself holds the view report and stuff like that. Um, I can see that it is done by a Power BI web, and there's a data set ID, data set ID, data sets, data source. So if it is something related to a data set ID, there will be a data set ID. Oh, sorry. This is a view report. So this data, this report is connected to a data set. So that has that, uh, the ID of the item itself, the Gen2 metrics. Uh, that's probably the name of the app. Uh, performance board. Uh, org ID and stuff like that. So, I mean, all these relevant information denormalized into items that I'm looking for. And uh, just to give you a sort of idea of like activity, so you, you know those are the activities. I should have ordered the bunny, shouldn't I? So it's in the longer we can look at. Uh, you can see that then it gets appended. You get information about all these activities. You know, if somebody, a copy, a report was copied, somebody created a new app. Somebody uh, deleted something. Somebody deleted a dashboard. You can look at the list of users that deleted. And there's like dates related to that. So creation date. Uh, so based on when this happened, you can say, you know, there were 10 dashboards that were created in this <clears throat> last week. And then we deleted three that were never used or whatever. So all those kind of insights could be driven. And when I'm doing this, this thing, what this means is also all these activities are being recorded for our case. It's not just a dimension. It's not the list of all activities that are available, but are all being done. So if somebody is, uh, you know, uh, printing a report, refreshing a data set, all those get here. Um, and you can, Whenever you look at the API itself, you, for your own particular case, you can run this try it mode, take that JSON for this, <coughs> excuse me, or you know, run this PowerShell, take a day worth of JSON, <coughs> look at the data, how it is. Um, you can do such things too to see, you know, how many refreshes do I have? How many things? So one of the other places where we do find or use would be to get this using the activity log the refresh, how many data sets are refreshed and if they're, you know, the their failure, success and stuff like that are going to be there as well. So if I do. If I do this. Red.
So if I look at this, so I have so many data set refreshes that happen. Um, so all these data set refreshes. Let's see, there's uh, this time itself is when that happened, when that activity happened. Um, there's one place, sorry for the quick scroll. Uh, there is one place where there is the, oh yeah, the, the on the type, if it is like by a, an API or what, um, yeah. So by API, <clears throat> So on demand is whenever you done it by uh, manually done it, and then there'll be like scheduled refresh or by API is whenever you're reached out using a, you know, an XML endpoint or some stuff like that. So, uh, so you get a list of items for any kind of activity that you do. Like you, know, you can just see that you know so many refreshes had had happened. I use a time to figure out when this happened, and uh, I have some insight about whatever I'm trying to do with the activity log. So this is one. Any questions on activity log before I go to the next API? Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a quick question. So when you run the PowerShell script, um, I don't know if I missed this part. Is that is that then storing the data in your um, in in a data lake? Where where is that actually being stored? And you're accessing it from SQL. Good. So uh, sorry, I I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, the current method is I'm putting it into uh, an on-prem SQL server. Um, so. The partial script itself could be a lot better. Again, um, sorry, but uh, the current method is it is do doing everything, all kind of transformations. It puts that activity into a JSON file, and then that JSON file is within the on-prem server itself. Um, I okay. did instead of doing it in two stages where I sh I should just ideally moving forward it should be just an API putting it into a raw table. And then within your Azure SQL, um, you have a stored procedure that runs async every day um, that uh, denormalizes this and puts it into a proper data format, uh, into a, its own you know, a transactional and dimensional data model. Uh, I did it just as a huge Franken table, uh, as they would call it. <clears throat> Everything is just tagged here. All the select itself is tagged here. Now, like I said, it's put into a JSON, and then I'm just reading it from that path, um, and I am throwing it into a table. I'm trying to do some checks before I throw it into a table. Again, all of these should be a part of a stored procedure, not here. Um, but um, current method, yes, everything goes into a SQL on-prem, um, and then there are better ways instead of doing inserts. Um, or sorry, yeah, only inserts happen. There's no real updates. So otherwise I would use merge. Um, thanks for that question. Any other yeah. question? Thank you. So that is your, that is the code. Uh, again, uh, I'm not going to go too much in depth about the PowerShell aspect of it or the coding aspect of it itself, but if you, have any questions once I post this in through um, the GitHub and on this link, please feel free to reach out. Um, that is the activity log. Now I'm going to show you the, the rest of other all APIs, and then I will go back and show each one at a time in a table format. Um, and again, this is the poor version of it. Um, how it all started. So all the top items are the same. You have all the, excuse me, um, the table lists and my um, you know, look backs and stuff like that. Um, now, one of the things is, uh, you know, like I said in my, this information 
capacity, workspace, that hierarchy is a little bit helpful for me to identify some aspects and you know create that data model that is very ideal for what I want it to capture and how I want them to be related. Um, so when I go back here, uh, you see that again, um, I'm not entirely talking about PowerShell script itself, but just the way how I have used those APIs, because some of these APIs do not have the entire picture that I'm looking for. They are there um, in a way. So I have used that knowledge to know how the artifacts are with each other. Um, so for instance, here you see that the workspace API is called and I get a list of uh, workspace in eight workspaces. And then I use it in a for, for each loop, which is good, great. And I, I just tag it into my next set of URLs that I'm gonna pass on for the REST APIs. Uh, and you can see that I've tagged IDs, capacity ID and name. So this information, this workspace ID might not be available in one of my downstream, um, in my downstream um, APIs where having it in a 4-H loop, I've just made sure that I've still captured that information so that data modeling happens accurately. So for the question that Andy had, had earlier, you know, I, I'm, I'm able to connect to that particular resource that I'm looking for. In this case, workspace, and you can see within this workspace itself, I'm having a bunch of APIs. Again, I'll go into the API too, but you know, on top, First, I'm getting the workspace related information, uh, report information. Let's see, this is a list of report information, and then there's a report page information under within the report uh, for each itself. So, again, I'm able to trade through uh, an API using another API because a single API like this report page uses report ID and workspace ID. Workspace ID already got from a previous API that I called and the, within the 4-H loop that it is in. Same thing with report. Uh, when I did this report URL and got it into this API and this 4-H loop, then using that within that, I'm invoking another API now. This might be a little uh, interesting method for a lot of people who are uh, uh, who are not so much into you know, having so much nested for each with, within APIs. So if you ever feel that way, please do let me know why. Uh, we can definitely think about it too in that aspect. But this helps me use those previous information and get that to tag what I want to. And in this case, as I said, that hierarchy that I showed here is helping me in this particular case real quick. Again, I'll go into the APIs a little bit, but just the code itself, my for each, first there was workspace, and then inside that there was report, and then inside that for each, I am having my report page information, API called. So this API only gives me, the report page API gives only three items that I'm looking for that is necessary, that is useful for me to tag about the report page itself. So I put it, tag it in a table, but I want to also know when I tag that, so it's easier for me to get that correlation. The report ID is there. That the, uh, once I have that report ID, I can always get connected to a workspace. If needed, I can connect it to a data set. So even though that API is not giving me everything I want, I am I am holding that as a part of my raw table. So that way, when I do the downstream sort procedures, it helps me do that uh, API calls appropriately. Um, <clears throat> so that is the page. The same thing with the uh, data set too. So now I have data set within the data set. I have multiple information like 
you know, the refreshes. Like you asked, is there a refresh history? So this gives me what uh, the refresh history of that data set was. I think this is still, this has like a 30 day limit or something. Um, but do I really, again, do I really care about all 30 days? Whenever I run, I hold somewhere, which tells me the last time it ran. So I'm going to use that look back period uh, to figure out what that last time it ran. So I get only append the rest of the information. So I don't even, whenever I'm even calling the API, I don't want to use that. So eventually this API itself would have a filter for that, for that time frame uh, based on the you know, end time or start time. Again, uh, some of these APIs, uh, again, you take a look at it, there might be some, um, some, some of the uh, API items, values that you get out of it that uh, might be useful for you. And you don't have, I don't have in my code at this time, but if it is useful for you, please feel free to pull it. Um, so that is one of the ways I've used the nesting of APIs to make sure I get the relevant information passing on uh, for the I for that uh, ultimate data model. Um, the same thing, data set parameters, the same thing with, you know, dashboard and dashboard files, because files are a part of dashboard. Um, now going back up, uh, I'll show like a couple of APIs. Uh, what I will also show is that, let's see, I already had it. I don't know if it uh, timed out or something. Um, oh my, okay. Let me redo this here. Um, um, sorry, how do I? Hmm. So if I get a list of this, yeah, please confirm, use that. Again, you can just see, uh, wait, is this dashboard? I get dashboard gonna do it for me to do this. So it gives me a list of dashboards in my group. Again, um, one of the one of the easy things is you know group ID is the same as like the uh, same as the workspace ID you have. So if I have a workspace ID, I'm just gonna copy that. Um, so and we have in our case. Uh, we don't enable, we have not, we have enabled, we have disabled any non uh, SSM health person to even log into or look at anything that we have in our links. So even if you see it, you might not be able to look at the link at all. Um, so I just put it in here. Uh, and then run it. So it gives me, you know, the name, the ID, and then a web URL and embed URL. I, mean, I really don't need these two unless I'm going to use it for some kind of embed analytics. I put it in like a, an app for somebody to go in and uh, see that, you know, this is a part of glossary, glossary and stuff like that. So you get kind of get an idea of the display name and so on and so forth. Uh, but again, you see that it's embedded within a value uh, object. So um, in my, my PowerShell, I'm calling it view of value after I convert it from JSON uh, so that I can get all my objects one by one and put it into a table. And going back to the API, going back to the API, uh, more other similar APIs uh, you could do. Um, here, especially like, you know, the data set refresh, data set, two things, actually key things in data set that I have noticed is the schedule and uh, uh, the data set schedule and the data set refresh, refresh history. So schedule is when 
uh, data set is scheduled to run. You can see that um, I have not run this API. Um, since it was more recent, uh, I have created the uh, partial script call for it, but I've not run it in our instance. But you get something like this, so you know a data set are run on like days and these times of those days. Uh, and you know, currently you can either have it daily or weekly, and then the times for it. So this is very valuable information. Um, in my case, the future of how this, there are two types of table you will have. One is a summary level table that just, that will just show you this information, and a detail level uh, table that is a uh, Cartesian product of the days and the times. So, you know, each day, like Sunday, let's just say, it'll have like four lines for Sundays, four lines for Friday, and so on and so forth. So, you can use that again in an actionable way, saying this particular uh, this particular data set is running all these times. Out of that, from your activity log or even the refresh um, um, this uh, refresh history, you can see that it runs what three times four uh, to uh, yeah twelve twelve times uh, a week it runs. But out of that, let's say six times it fails constantly over uh, since the time it was created. You can use that in your database. You can look at that. You can get insights saying, you know, I have this refresh schedule 12 times a week. I have the refresh history that tells me it's failed six times every week. Uh, is it necessary? Am I wasting my resources trying to have this run? Is there, is there like time modes that are happening that are not just uh, that, that that's not just affecting this because you know it's trying to use a memory for a different refresh resource for a different resource for refresh instead of this one getting that um, so all those kind of insights can be driven based on all these connections again the same thing the refresh history is a key one for data set so you get a list of items um, so you get to know if it is refreshed via api so one you can you can either refresh using uh, 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 just by going into your uh, your, uh, con your workspace and then refreshing it uh, here. Yes. This is so big. Um, yeah, going into the workspace and just refreshing, doing a scheduled refresh, then you will see. Then, you know, this would be like scheduled by API or uh, on demand if you manually went and like click that refresh button. And it gives you the start and end, the status, if it is failed or completed. If it is completed, it won't give you an error message. Otherwise, there is an error message that tells you the reason why it failed. It's the same thing whenever you see an error message here. Uh, let's say for some reason, my refresh failed. Uh, well, at least one would have failed. One, like, where is it? Everything. Okay. Um, let's see if this failed. Yeah, there is a failure. So this failure message um, is what will show up. I know this is not the entire message. If I click show, it will show me, but I don't want any sensitive information to show up. Uh, but you would get that same error message in your API call. Those are about the APIs and how you can see those that information. I'll show you the table itself related to those APIs that I just spoke about. And again, oh, sorry, before I even show the tables, again, another refresher on, oh no, sorry, wrong one. This one, <clears throat> yeah, so again, this one, capacity, workspace, with the data set related information, report information, data dashboard. And again, these are not the exhaustive results of a list of uh, APIs. We saw a bunch of APIs that were there. 
uh, there's an app, app workspace related one. You can do the same information for app workspace and have a parallel one. So you have multiple app workspaces for each app, each workspace. You can get information on that. Uh, and there's information about users. So you can, you know, what users are using uh, what more frequently. And again, for admins, there is a usage metrics app. So if you're using that, you don't have to see this, use this again. However, uh, there are some limitations to the out of the box ones. I, I believe there might be like a 90 day time frame for all the insights and stuff like that. So please take a uh, take a look at it. Some of those um, don't work the best for us. So we when we created this, uh, it started already giving us more value. Um, Excuse me, the dashboard you created is how you can talk of all this stuff. Huh? Eventually, I'm pleased to say, eventually, see the dashboard that's created off of all of this. All of this data model. I mean, um, that's the, in my mind, would be the end goal, right? Is that you've got a Power BI dashboard, which is the whole thing your Power BI dashboard. Yes, we do have one. I don't know if I can show it. Oh, no, I don't have that. I'm not expecting that. Maybe, I'm just thinking in my head as far as that. Yes, definitely there is one. Outside of this call, I can show it to you. Um, but our, when it's not being recorded, I can show it to everybody else, too. Um, all right, so. There is a definite, uh, not just one, there are multiple because some of them are admin related. Uh, so we created data sets that look at the health of the workspaces from an admin perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, created some uh, data set for developers so they know that relationship between a report and a data set when something fails, even though admin gets notified, developer, it's developer's responsibility to contact the end user so they know which data sets failed and they can look at that and see which reports are connected to which data sets. <coughs> Excuse me, because of this. And without premium, are any of the APIs available for use? Or is that you have to have a premium license to get any of the APIs? <coughs> Excuse me, I think, uh, uh, it's been a while since I saw that information. I, I, I apologize. I just, I'm yeah. That's a, as, I, as I make clients and they're uh, wondering about the benefits of, of premium. So the XMLA endpoints themselves are available, I believe, only using premium. Okay. Um, so there are only three methods. One is either you know, the regular one, you just get that Power BI uh, works, regular workspace, and you have a pro license. One is with a premium capacity and one is premium per user. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those two premium and premium per user, you can do this. Uh, again, the thing is not that it's the APIs are available for them, but it's the fact that you cannot, I don't think you can configure non-premium workspaces to connect to an XML endpoint, which is how yeah, you connect ACA APIs. So, um, and again, of course, uh, you know, the required scope and everything are there. Uh, so if you do not have access to a workspace or something, you won't be able to see that information when you're calling the API. So make sure you're a Power BI admin, you're a capacity admin, so you can see this. And if you have a service principal, not so much, but maybe like a service, uh, um, service user, uh, service account, that has access, the same access, like as a Power BI admin um, that can get this information from the, using the API and then throw it into a table. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, where was I going? Tables. All right, so these tables, uh, there, let me show a couple of those. Sorry, I know I'm not even uh, displaying my um, uh, Power BI. It's not displaying my, uh, uh, I'm not showing my uh, camera or anything because of the way I'm trying to uh, 
percent here. Sorry, what? You see that screen? You see that screen? Okay. Uh, no, it's just uh, I'm not showing my camera. Uh, I'm not on camera because I'm in an awkward position to uh, do all these. So I apologize. So <clears throat> one of the things you can see is oh, even before I show some of the other parts, one of the other things I was talking a little bit earlier about is the reporting catalog. So all these, you know, report information, blah, 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 they all get connected to a reporting catalog. So we did create one for like change control and like uh, uh, report info, uh, yeah, report info and change control. So what those are basically, whenever something changes in a report, again, the purpose of the report that I was talking about earlier. Um, so it gives you an idea of when the, what the report is doing. Um, show an example so we use the report uh, page kind of information for us to uh, you know connect to the report and filter it on each report to know uh, to give you that information so um yeah i was going to show this too. sorry some of the some of these time things right before i came here i did something weird with my connectivity at work and i had uh, when I unplugged my monitor, it did something weird and I lost some of the things that were not working. Um, uh, all right. So as an example, what that is, this is very rudimentary and I cannot show you the data itself, which is why I have it on a separate screen. So if you give me a second, um, so in our case, we have like a report and we, ha we have like, if you're one of those, if you were in one of those uh, three part series that I showed, this was a part of that, you know, how we have this about page, <clears throat> what this report does. Um, purpose, description, owner, audience, and logic are the parts that show for each of the report. So the back end is connected. For this, we have an app where the, our developers put in what this, what the logic of this particular report is and stuff like that. Um, but it is connected to each of the reports. So we need that report ID connection and also to data set because this data itself is baked into the data set. So we hold this in memory and then we use the APIs to connect to that report information and everything. So all, all these kind of like come together in that way. And this is the about page. There is a hidden uh, change control uh, too. Uh, let me see. Yeah, there's a hidden change control too. It just lists, gives us the list of, you know, when something was changed. Uh, again, there is a backend stuff for this that we created um, that has some change information about the report itself, about the data, the dashboard itself that you're looking at. Um, so again, there's a separate one for data sets too. So all these, the back end for developers, there's a separate connectivity. Outside of the control panel, I like this as a control. Yeah. Right. So this way developers would know what happened last yeah. and they can roll back and stuff like that. Outside of, you know, if you're using any code repo, you could still do that, but you know, it's kind of it's a lot more visual. And you have to again a central place, a single glossary that we can have, everything ties back into it because this goes into a database and that database is pulled into a data set where all the developers can see what they look into a report that they are trying to modify, they can immediately get this information too. Um, so for a lot of various things, we use this information basically. Um, all right, so now going back to the table. So Power BI. So the capacity for that will only show so I have a bunch of reports. Gosh, I might have another reports. 
Um, so you see how like all kinds of like reports, data sets. So you kind of can see that there's like, you know, we have put information for statuses. So this comes partly from API, multiple APIs. Um, so even though this is not the straightforward thing that we're doing, but um, again, one of the APIs can influence another one, not just in storing that ID, but also the activity log lets me know that something was deleted. My API itself doesn't tell me that. The report info API, it only, only gives me a list of all the reports. It doesn't give me the status of the reports. So I look at what was deleted yesterday, every day that is being looked into and it's, it flips the status underneath. So my activity log finds all the reports that are deleted on a day and it says, go and flip the status to delete it. Uh, if somebody modified something, uh, that information is not available. So I would just have that modified by the person their ID tagged onto that. So it's your micro, your uh, service, uh, it's your UPN, our user principle. Um, so that is what is tagged into the created and modified by. Uh, so you know when somebody modifies something, when somebody created something and somebody else had modified it. By accident, on purpose, whatever the case may be, the status active deleted. So you get a list of active ones that you have. And again, ideally, I would have named this report status active, yes or no, and then just be a yes or no or zero one, whatever. So it's a lot more simpler holding it. You can see Power BI report is there. Now, most of them are reports, but also there are Power BI uh, or paginated reports. And you can see that they don't have a data set ID. Um, I'm not gonna go into some of the Power BI reports themselves that don't have a data set ID because some of them are written from a personal workspace, so I don't have access to that. So whenever I created one part of, whenever I ran one of one part of the API, it worked and not the other one. So you wouldn't see the, those data set IDs too, but that's something I'm not too worried about because again, it's a personal workspace. I don't care so much about those ones. Um, uh, not so per the public workspaces that we have set up for all the Power BI reports, there's a data set ID and I can connect it back to the data set. Paginated reports never have a data set ID because they could have multiple data sets. So that's the one caveat that I mentioned earlier. Let's keep that in mind. Other than that, I mean, you can see, you can connect it. Um, pretty much straightforward for the report. Now, um, sorry, let me move this real quick here. It's a little bit harder for me to see like this. And I'll move it back in one sec. So some of the ones I already wrote, uh, let me see and make sure. I have some pre-written queries that I'm looking at. So I'm not, uh, I can show you some more examples of insights using the APIs. Uh, okay, so for a, for instance, this one, you can see that I've connected the data set refresh history. That's the one that gives us what data sets ran when and when they failed or what. So if I look at this, it just gives me a list of data sets, their status, their runtime, their status, and stuff like that. So 
let me also show that on another screen so you have an idea of that API as well. This is running, I'll show you this. Yeah, I think it ran, but so you could kind of get an idea. Um, <clears throat> so I have the workspace name, I have the data set ID, and you see they're all connected to each other. So the data set refresh is connected to the data set, so I know which data set it is, because I only store like the IDs, not the attributes. Any other attribute that I want about the data set, I can connect to. I mean, the workspace, I know where it's coming from. And then also the uh, this one I will go into a little bit later, um, but I'm looking for specific Power Query information. Um, so this is not an API, uh, but you can use uh, DMVs to figure out what is within a Power Query, so the applied step and stuff like that. Um, whenever, I mean, you're, if you're familiar with Power Query and applied steps and uh, M queries within the Power Query, um, this holds the list of that. Um, it gives you, you know, what that applied step is, if it is you know, transforming something and stuff like that. So I created a way to capture that and uh, put it in a table here too. So we can take a look at that. In this case, yeah. But in this case, I'm looking for specific queries that are not, you know, in the list of this. Um, and I'm looking at status where it's failed, you know, SPDR, that's the data set refresh. So if anything failed, then show me a list of all those. So it's telling me all these data sets failed. I could have the data set name, so it's a lot more easier for me. Uh, let's use this uh, to identify what is happening and then no, I could also have included that the, the created by modified by, so I can look at who last modified it. Uh, and I can see that, you know, there's a, an error message that tells me, you know, something didn't go right in the, uh, in the refresh. So I can look at that again. All these now I'm showing you in the tabular format. There is a way to put this again in the data set and show in Power BI itself so you can view everything about your Power BI in Power BI. So Power BI metadata, everything in Power BI. Um, so again, uh, this is one of them. Uh, let's see, for your question about if I can see that, this is that connection, okay. Uh, it gives me also, you know, whenever it started, whenever it ran, some of the times, you know, it hogs a lot of uh, time. I mean, in this case, it just is like a minute or so, I guess. But there might be situations where it's running for like two hours and then query timeout happens because of that. So all those kind of things you can go through and you can, yeah, yeah look at this. So it's like 20 minutes or so. So you can kind of use that duration and do the top 10 based on duration, worst durations see if something can be done about those failed ones and if they need to be running during that time frame. So those kind of insights can happen. Uh, sorry, again, I'm gonna have to move this here, gosh. <clears throat> and I'll be right back up there. Um, So the okay, the same thing with um, report. Uh, whoops. whoops. Uh, excuse me, sorry. So these ones are 
here a list of items. Uh, hold on. All right. So, okay. I'll let them run. All right. So, these are a set of DMEs. Again, these are not APIs, but these are part of Power BI metadata. Um, real quick, I want to uh, mention about the DMEs. So, moving from the REST APIs into the world of DMEs and still part of Power BI metadata. Any questions on the APIs before I move on? Um, actually, you know, as a precursor or uh, as a thing that's coming in the future, so how all of this is getting transformed is how it will look like in the future. I am trying to like just put it into functions and just call those functions um, uh, as an example. Uh, you know, one of these. APIs, what I'm trying to find out is uh, one of these functions, I'm trying to find out the list of API uh, values of the you know, API fields, uh, so to speak. Uh, so a list of this, what this is, is just, I have put this in here, but it's pretty much what those, what those, uh, what the code is doing. It's just giving me a list of columns that I'm getting out of the, my API itself. Uh, I put it in an Excel spreadsheet just for us to view. And I mean, I'll, I can post this too, uh, but this will get outdated quickly. Uh, but this particular function does that. It checks and finds, gives you that information. Um, I have another function that figures out the column difference between that list of val uh, columns in the API to its corresponding table variant that we have in our Azure SQL. So if there is a new column that is added in the API, you can immediately know and you might like, you know, just add that to your table. So it pull, pulls that relevant information too. Um, and the final one of these is where it's just writing it into a SQL table, uh, whatever that function is. So, I mean, eventually I would break this down into like multiple, um, PowerShell scripts themselves with the separate functions. So, uh, call somebody. No, 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 that was. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. <clears throat> so yeah, this is just uh, trying to. I, I wrote this function to just put it into uh, a SQL table. So it's just gonna get it, put it into a SQL table. So ideally, what would be best practice is. You put all the contents of the API just like in a SQL table. So for example, I have this. So one of this uh, SQL itself is for the, you can see it's got, I'm calling it data set info raw. Um, all the columns are coming from the API. So So this API um, will hold this, all this raw information. And then within your system, you have a sort procedure or something that talks to multiple of these raw tables and makes sure you have the right final star schema. Um, and you know, just for data set info, this is kind of like what I would have at the final table. So API call throws that into this using that PowerShell script I showed you, uh, direct dump of data. And then you write store procedures to talk to multiple of those uh, raw tables. Um, and then all those raw tables give you the relevant information you need for your particular table. Uh, and again, all these create tables will be made available in my GitHub once they are ready. So you can just roll this out as an entire package. Um, along with the API script. So you can use that API script to throw it in here. Um, they'll all be, again, a single package um, <clears throat> that you can use to have data for the long term for insight. Um, uh, and again, uh, you could either have Power BI append to the name of it, or you can just create a schema, or if you wanna just put it in a database separate depending on what you have access to, what your resources are, and how would they look like, uh, what your permissions are and stuff like that. So um, 
just as an example. That's how it would be. That's how it is. I mean, I'm writing all these code, the create table code, and the sort procedure code for that in the back end. Um, that is all for the REST API part of the metadata. Now, I was talking something about the DMVs, and most, if not all of you, were using Power BI on a regular basis are familiar with um, DMVs. Uh, if not, just a quick thing, you know, whenever you are in a, uh, in a data set. Um, there are external tools that are very helpful. Uh, new material of what you do. Um, these three that I have, that I constantly use are very useful for me. ALM Toolkit, DAX Studio, Tabular Editor. Uh, Tabular Editor is a non-enterprise version, so it's free. Um, uh, so the, these three are very helpful because uh, I mean they're open they're, they're open source um, very for various reasons. But in this particular case, to look at the DMVs themselves, we're going to look at the DAX Studio one. So either I go to the particular data set I'm looking for and I click on Data Studio, and then it opens up. I already have it open, so I'll just move it over here. You can see that there are something called and this is the newer version. So if you're thrown off by using prior DAX Studio, which is light theme, and they when they came up with the dark theme, which is cool, I immediately, I mean, I think it's by default now, uh, which is cool. Um, <clears throat> so you have a bunch of DMVs uh, that are especially in the DM schema, uh, like the partitions one. So it tells me what my list of partitions are. Um, so it gives me the partition information, or if I'm looking for like the list of measures, uh, I think the connection became sour. What happened? One second. Uh, so if I go to DMV, let's see the DM schema. I can look at the tables. If I run it, it'll give me a list of tables. So I have like transactional audit. I mean date tables. And if you're familiar with Power BI, you can see that the local date tables are not all created. But other than that, you can see the transactional audit measures table or what are in this. The transactional audit measures table, image table, that's the table. Um, and it gives me some information about the table, um, some information about uh, what what else am I looking for? The calculation groups, where are groups? Our rule API calculation groups. Um, if I have created any, I did not create in this one case. Um, uh, so on and so forth. I mean, roles, I can do relationships. If I've created roles in this one, I did not create any, but you know, there's like an RLS, like for role level security or object level security, I've created roles and stuff like that, and you can always use that. These are all the DMVs that co are commonly there. So what I'm saying is you could use this. Um, now, I, in the current state it is, it is a little bit more manual. Uh, you could always connect to, if you have access to uh, the data itself as an admin or a um, higher than a viewer, I believe, you could look into the data, uh, the workspace this way. So if I connect it using SSMS, it's an analysis service because underlying that's what it is. Uh, developers, that's what I'm looking for. So if I connect to it, am I over okay. or utilizing or something? No. Right. So you can see that it's showing all of my data sets, and I can see all of this information. I can write an MDX query and stuff like that here. 
it's the same thing that you see in the DAX Studio too. Uh, so I could write that same select star to see what my data set has within here. Uh, so what does that mean? So I could ideally like right click script it as a database. This is for a slightly more manual method. Uh, and again, there's a, an automated method if you write like C sharp script, uh, which is a little bit more, uh, I mean, again, it's work in progress and that's gonna be a separate topic I'll cover later. But um, uh, if I just do this, it'll create, uh, it'll create that database itself. As, a, as an XML schema, you will see that it's, it says, you know, create database, blah, blah, blah. It has all the information about uh, the name of my table, the columns that within the table, and so on and so forth. So it gives me a lot of information um, that I could use to figure out something about it. Um, now, what is that something? It's very essential. So if I go back here, you see I've written some of those for each of the data set. And that's like, you know, one is the power query info, one is the calculation group info, measures info, and I have a few more like that, but just as an example of what they do. So this has my applied steps, the power query info. So it tells me the, what the source is. It gives me all those applied steps that you see within the power query. So whatever I see uh, in here in the power query, um, yeah, whatever I see in my power query, the applied steps here. Yeah, so. Uh, so, I mean, I have like a SharePoint root folder and how I connect it to it and so on and so forth. So, uh, this is my. You know, this is my, for one of my queries, this is my um, applied steps and everything. So this is my power query, sorry. Um, and all the applied steps within the power query. So this entire let in information is what you are seeing here for various of those tables. Um, <clears throat> So what this helps is for you to programmatically scrape that information about the source. Uh, and in our system, we have asked people to do a specific kind of transformation and they're selecting all the columns to select other columns to make sure when you do the select other columns, it selects those columns that you have selected uh, um, so that we can keep that in our applied steps list. You, again, you could use it for scraping the information out of it. Um, that is one thing. And also, I mean, it holds information about uh, rolling window granularity. So this is about the incremental refresh. If you have any particular table that has incremental refresh, um, yeah, then it tells me there's a two year rolling period and then one day it gets refreshed. So that the thing, the um, entire storage period is two years, but the refresh period is one day, is what that means. Uh, so that is stored here too. Uh, you get that information, you know, in this case, there's 13 months of data, and then last one month is refreshed. Uh, so any changes within the last month is always get refreshed, and so on and so forth. Um, so all this, Beneficial information for again long term insights are used. And again, you can think about connecting this to your source, identifying what source you have in the applied step, step to which of my data set, to which of my report, and figure out which of the data set sets are failing, see which of the sources I have, what kind of information I'm getting from my source system. If something is not running fine there, I could use this query. Uh, again, a front end data set to tell me those list of data sets are not going to be available. Those set of reports are not going to be available. Um, the same thing with this bottom one, the calculated group. The calculation group is another one uh, where 
you have created calculation groups, you can look at the code for that and stuff like that. So in this case, it's not really any kind of um, EHR or any insensitive information. So uh, sorry, any sensitive information. So I'm going to just copy that. You can see how it looks like. Looks looks like the ugly. Um, how can I show this? That's too much money. Uh, so uh, this dark mode is not helping me at this moment. Okay, let me just move this. So you can just see that this is. My calculation group expression, it's telling me this is the list of items I'm putting in here. This is my tax query basically for that calculation group. Uh, the same thing for my measures. I think I have already run this. Again, you could get insights of what that particular calculation group is doing. For the glossary purposes, again, you have a description that you put within the calculation groups themselves on the site. That's what gets pulled here. None of it is filled for the demo. For some of these, we didn't fill it yet. Uh, some of this, you can see that the measures are there. Again, whatever you put in a column information as description will show up here. The status, the measure itself, if it's you know, all the DAX information for that, the name of the measure, um, so on and so forth is there. So again, you can use this as a glossary. You can use this as a template. You can use this as a, a front end for some power users, so they know what is happening within the measures. Because a lot of times, power users do not have access to the data sets. Uh, they they have access to the data set, but they do not have access to um, see what is underlying within the. Um, measures and stuff like that, they can only build off of it. So um, then what they can do is instead of trying to go into each and every single data set separately to figure out what the measure is, they can just go here, figure out, uh, I mean, get, just get the data set um, that they're looking for and uh, you know filter into this particular measure name, look it up, and they can just get the related tax and they know what is happening with that particular query with that particular field that they're doing, if it's the field that they want or that they want changes and then they just request that to us. Again, this is a separate type of metadata, but still metadata that's valuable for a lot of stuff um, that we do. Another couple of things are there too. I'm not gonna show much about it, um, but the concept itself, I will tell you, uh, that Power BI, uh, since I showed you the Power Query, uh, the information is stored here. There is another, uh, there are another couple of things that connect back to like uh, our source. So we have a place where we store the metadata of our source, and then we look that up to see if the Power Query holds any of those columns and connect it to those columns. So we have a list of uh, data sets that, are con that connect to a particular server, database, table, and column. So again, we can talk or whenever there are changes happening in the source, we can connect it to the downstream impacts and figure out what needs to be mitigated. That's pretty much it. Any questions? Any questions that you might have about this? Uh, both REST API related Power BI metadata or the metadata that's co that comes out of DMVs. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much for patiently being on this call and being here. 
Uh, I hope some of this, or at least, uh, yeah, most of this is useful uh, for you at various levels. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out outside of this call too. And once again, when, when there's the GitHub stuff related to the, all of this, I will uh, post it out in the link as well so that you can go back and look at the GitHub connected, do it, do all pieces or all of it for your system. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.